here on Wednesday night. Amen. Amen. What a blessing. I made a comment a couple weeks ago that uh, there are probably very, very few churches of any kind in Jacksonville that had what we had that night. And I think we probably had about the same thing tonight where we had like five men in suits and ties on the front porch of the church greeting people. I mean, did any of you feel like he was going through the gauntlet? I mean, coming up there, you know, trying to get to the chair, uh, to the door, you know, and everybody's reaching out for your hand, trying to help you and all this kind of stuff, and <coughs> sticking stuff in your hands, saying, fill this out, and uh, giving prayer cards and things like that. God bless you. Take your Bibles, please, and turn in the New Testament to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I love the, what they call the pastoral epistles. That's just a, a name they've come up with to refer to 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. They're called that because they all have to do with the church ministry and how a pastor is supposed to run, rule, lead uh, a church. Tells you how the officers are supposed to be set up. Tells you uh, what's supposed to be preached and taught and the emphases and, and those kind of things. Uh, it talks about... Uh, financial support of people uh, who are in need, and uh, a lot of things. And 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you find it, would you stand with me, please, in reverence for the reading of the Scripture. This is one of those great passages of the Bible for someone like me, because 1 Timothy 4 basically says, if it moves and I can thank God for it, I can eat it. So you just be watch out for anything at your house. You better be sure you let me know it's a pet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see that as we get through here in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit ex uh, speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, folks, there's two main arenas in which this happens. One is the educational arena, and the other is what we might call the religious or spiritual <clears throat> arena. And uh, the context here brings to mind for some of you in the what we might call the religious arena a group that might specialize in some of these things that are referred to here in the context of doctrines of devils. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy. What kind of hypocrisy? Well, a lot of them. But, but I mean, why in the world would you call somebody uh, a father that you believe should never matter? Really? I mean, why would he have the title Father when you're not going to ever let him be one right. legitimately? <laughs> Forbidding to marry. That's what verse 3 is about. Forbidding to marry. I only know that one church makes a big thing about not letting people get married. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Of course, I still think fish is a meat. I don't care if you do say, well, you eat fish on Friday. You just can't eat something else. <laughs> commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God, that includes goat, amen, if you'll eat it. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, Thou should be a good minister of Jesus Christ. So I'm supposed to tell you this. I'm supposed to point out to you that doctrines of devils are still running around today. Mm -hmm. Amen. Nourished up into the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables. And exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercises profiteth, or exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Amen. We're going to pause our scripture reading there, but, but 
But we'd like to draw your attention really to two verses, 7 and 8, but we'll just read verse 7. But refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. May we pray. Heavenly Father, please bless the reading, the reception, and the preaching and teaching of the Word of God tonight. Amen. May the Holy Spirit make these things personal to the hearts of those who've come here. I pray that we'd not look at it as just a lesson. I pray that we'd not look at it as just a message. But I pray that it would be a message from you unto us. I pray the Holy Spirit would indeed make it personal for each one of us. May we leave here better off than when we came in. Father, we thank you for our answered prayer. We thank you for the new members that you gave us this past Sunday. Thank you for visitors you continue to send our way. And thank you for outreach. Thank you for your blessing, the numerous ways and way we try to get the Word of God out, try to get the gospel out. Bless the Word of God as it goes forth here uh, tonight, that when we leave, we may take the Word of God out in the world. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. 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 Won't you be seated, please? <coughs> Well, that's a pretty tough word for anybody that loves a recliner. And that's the word exercise. Verse 7, exercise thyself. Verse 8, bodily exercise. See the word exercise in each of those verses, and I'll talk to you about that, about that word tonight. And uh, we're going to draw some, some similarities and observe some lessons from physical exercise that hopefully will illustrate about spiritual exercise. It's a whole lot better for you to exercise thyself unto godliness. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now, aren't you glad, some of you, that we're not going to bring a message on physical exercise? Amen. Somebody say, amen. amen. Okay? <laughs> Boy, could we get all under conviction real fast. Yes, we could. If we got to talking about physical exercise. <laughs> so I'm not going to, other than to say that the average Christian in America is in poor physical condition. That's just the state of America. And, uh, I mean, he, he reflects the culture, and the culture is, uh, don't bug me, man. I am trying to make my way uh, to the remote control. <laughs> if he's not headed to the remote control, he's headed to the buffet. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All you can eat. It's like it's a contest. <laughs> yeah, right. Amen. All you can eat. There, the sign is everywhere. The average Christian uh, man or woman, uh, full grown, is at least 50 pounds overweight. The average, I would say, in America. And the average Christian in America, not including all of the other things that they might have wrong with him when he goes to the doctor to be examined, you know, he says, well, this number's too high, this number's too low, this number's crazy, you know, all, all that kind of thing. Um, the average Christian is just flat, worn out, and tired, and really can just barely get himself to do the things that he ought to do uh, every day. Amen. Now, I do believe there's a time for rest. I do believe there's a time for sleep and all that. But I'm just saying that many, many Christians don't have enough energy to just do the things that they feel like they should do every day. Amen. And there's no doubt in my mind about it that the reason why some Christians don't go to Sunday school is they can't get themselves out of the bed yeah. to come to Sunday school. Amen. We've got a good crowd here tonight on a Wednesday night. But I guarantee you there's some people who are not in church tonight because they're too tired to be able to get themselves out and come uh, to church tonight. It's too much of an effort uh, for them. If you and I, I I've, I've often said something like that the greatest physical wake-up call that you could get would be to purchase a full-length mirror. <laughs> Amen. And just put it up anywhere. Amen. Bathrooms preferred, okay? 
And that'll, that'll get you, uh, that's what we might call a reality check. Right. Yeah. Okay? I mean, you can only hold your breath for so long. <laughs> <laughs> if we could see, though, if we could get a spiritual, fully mirror of how we look spiritually, we might really be shocked. I mean, I look at folks in church, and the church, we really look pretty decent. Come on, I mean, you can cover up everything, right? Where nobody knows what's underneath there. I told you, I think it was Sunday, that somebody said that the average preacher who looks like a Greek god in an expensive suit who takes a suit off looks like a Greek restaurant. <laughs> He doesn't look like a horse car, right? It looks like the whole family. <laughs> Probably spiritually speaking, the average Christian spiritually is more than 50 pounds, maybe 75 or 100 pounds overweight, spiritually uh, speaking, as far as keeping him from being able to do what he knows he ought to do. Well, preacher, I just can't, I just can't come to everything. And you look at some Christians and they do come to everything. And you say, well, my schedule is not like theirs is and, and all that. But the fact is, is a lot of us, spiritually speaking, are just really grossed out, overweight. And we can't get ourselves enough strength to do the smallest task uh, for the Lord. The average Christian really needs some spiritual exercise. I'm not going to give you a hard time about physical exercise unless it's just by accident, okay, uh, tonight. But the title of the message is, We Need to Exercise. Amen. We need to exercise because the Bible says in verse 7, exercise. Yeah. That is a command. It says, Refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. I'm going to be talking about spiritual exercise. Yeah, and, uh, of course, when we think about physically speaking, uh, those of us who are concerned about our physical exercise and all that, it's really hard to compensate with enough exercise. I mean, really, if you go to a buffet, you know you almost have to climb Mount Everest <laughs> and come down to compensate for what you did <laughs> at, that, at that buffet. It's scary. Any of you ever looked at the calories you supposedly are burning when you're walking on that machine and you're done with it and you're sweating and you're tired and you look at it and it says 300 calories. <laughs> calls for a Coca-Cola. Yeah, and then you go into the you go into the thrift store and to try to save yourself some time. You take one of the sandwiches out of the thrift store, already made up, all you gotta do is put it in the microwave. You look at it and it says, 590 calories. <laughs> you wait, you say, wait a minute, I gotta do what I just did twice <laughs> just to make it even out. The average Christian isn't overweight spiritually because he gets too much food from the Bible. But he's overweight because of all the junk food that he gets. From books, magazines, television, internet, newspaper, and radio. So spiritually speaking, he hasn't been taken in good fuel. Spiritually speaking, he looks like Buddha. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to give you some spiritual exercises. I'm going to camouflage them as physical exercises, try to point at some things and maybe help us to remember. Number one, I'm going to refer to the spiritual exercise of counting on the Lord. We need to grow and grow in the area of counting on the Lord. You need to grow in faith, okay? I'm going to call this walking. Walking. That, really, that's a great exercise, walking. Nothing wrong with walking. I've made fun of, the, you know, some of you may 
get on that thing and you walk 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 and you can't believe it when you're done, you know, that you have not walked away that Big Mac. It's really discouraging sometimes when you actually start looking at those numbers. But the Christian life is compared to a walk. And you know how we walk? According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. So I'm saying, I'm comparing this to counting on the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. That means you learn to go through every day of your life growing in your dependency on God Almighty Amen. and your Savior, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in order to walk with the Lord, you've got to be in agreement with the Lord. Right. Yeah. It is a walk of faith, but it's also a walk where you've got to agree with Him. Amos 3.3, 3. anybody know that, that verse? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Let me encourage you to grow in this exercise. And when you walk with the Lord, you need to depend on the Lord. And one of the things you gotta depend on is you need to depend on the Lord for direction. Make up your mind that you're gonna follow God. Amen. Make up your mind you're gonna follow the Lord. He's leading you, you just may not be following him. Amen. I believe a lot of us don't follow the Lord as much as we think we do. Right. But we are all led by the Lord. Because the Bible says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Over in Romans chapter 8. Amen. So every last one of you who are saved, if you're saved, you're led by God. Amen. I do not believe that everything everybody does who's saved is under God's leadership. Right. I don't believe that by any means. Yeah. Somebody says, well, God finally... Well, how, how long do you think God had to wrestle with that thing in his mind before he figured out where he wanted you to go to church? Yeah. How long do you think God had to contemplate and meditate and weigh the, co the pros versus the cons before he finally decided, you know, this is what you ought to do. God knows what you ought to do. Right. You end up spending 40 years in the wilderness wandering around going from place to place without getting to where you're supposed to be at, it's not God's fault. Right. It's unbelief, it's rebellion, disobedience on our part. Amen. Not only should we do this walking exercise with uh, dependency upon the Lord for direction, but also I'll call it dependency on Him for deliverance while we're walking. Amen. Uh, and I say that just simply because that while you may have a, a way that you can walk at your house with some kind of an automatic, automatic treadmill or something like that, or perhaps you're a member of a gym where you're not scared about walking there, but if you walk otherwise, there are people, to, to me, where they walk is dangerous. I'm amazed at single women who will walk all over Jacksonville. I don't think that's safe. Amen. I wouldn't recommend it to any woman to, to walk alone uh, almost anywhere in, uh, in Jacksonville. Walking can be dangerous. I'm thankful that you and I, as we walk for the Lord, listen, if you start walking with God before God, whether it be when you just first got saved or some of you, you know, you've rededicated your life to the Lord, you're trying to walk with I promise you that there are some people out there there's some forces out there, there's some spiritual forces out there that don't want you to su succeed in your walk. Right. They don't want you to get where you're trying to go. Right. Some of you are trying to walk with God, some of you are trying to walk to a, a greater place of effectiveness in your Christian life. Yeah. Now, I want you to know the devil doesn't want you to get there. Right. And he'll try to do his best to stop you. But let me say that the Lord is with you if you're in agreement with him. I'm glad that Enoch walked with God. Amen. I believe you can walk with God. Another exercise that I'll mention has to do with charity and giving. Charity and giving. And I'm going to call that exercise stretching. Some of us need to stretch. Amen. Come on, when you, when you tithe, never Christian ought to tithe, but when you tithe and your tithe comes out so that when you give your tithe, 
You put your num number of bills in the plate and... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you figured out that temp, didn't you? <laughs> that preacher can't accuse you of robbing God. <laughs> You got it down, buddy. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Stretch. <laughs> <laughs> round her up. I mean, some of y'all do that in a restaurant. Would you like to round it up? <laughs> sure. I'm from Skin Flint. Round it up. What'd you say? Uh, Was it eight dollars and ninety-three cents? Yeah, round it up to nine. <laughs> Do it for the Lord. Stretch out. The Bible does say this. And by the way, it, it, it does all so good. Just to do some stretching every now and then. With regard to our growth. That's right. And giving. The Bible does say this. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Amen. That has to do with going, giving when it's talking about sowing and reaping there. It's talking about giving. I'm talking about your tithe. <coughs> if you do it faithfully. Somebody said, give until it hurts. Amen. If you give faithfully enough, it'll stop hurting. <laughs> it'll actually become enjoyable. I mean, really, you'll, you'll be able to write that check out and it won't hurt one bit. Amen. Do you know the Lord says in his word, for God loveth the giver that gives right up to the point it hurts. Yeah. <laughs> no. The Bible says, for the Lord loveth a, a cheerful giver. Amen. So go ahead and give. Wait back to hurting. Go ahead. Go ahead and give until you laugh about it. <laughs> Wait, the wife finds out what I gave this one. <laughs> a cheerful giver. Amen. Offerings are what you give above the tithe. If you want to designate it, designate it. But if you just Throw it into an offering plate. God knows what you're doing. Amen. And he knows whether you're tithing. He knows whether you're giving offerings. Um, I believe that you can stretch by going beyond that. I believe your tithes and offerings ought to go to the church, but, but it's possible for you to go beyond that. You could, actually, you could actually buy one of our folks a, a meal sometime. Amen. You might go, go and you know, buy somebody in the church that's got a need. Buy them that. I remember, I remember one time in, uh, in a church that I pastored, and we were trying to, trying to get around and had old cars. Most of the time I've had old cars through the years. I tell you, I would like new cars. I just hate new car payments, okay? I hate them. And so uh, most of our cars have been old through the years. Now, I remember we had, a, we had a man in our church that actually gave my wife a car. Wow. Is that the one we called Rusty? <laughs> it was a, can you guess it was a car from up north? You know, snow and icing down the roads and all that, that kind of thing. But, but it worked, didn't it, Ms. O'Neill? We loaned Rusty out to people who... Who needed a car? We just about had to call the cops to get Rusty back. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? That brother, that brother was stretching. He was stretching in his giving. Yeah. I'll mention, because I'm not mentioning his name, but I'll mention, same fellow I, I, uh, I called because I knew he was a gun nut, and I called him and I asked him, uh, some years ago, a couple, at least a couple of three years ago, I asked him if he could give me a recommendation of uh, where I could uh, get a good, good buy on an AR-15. I said, I don't have one. I'd like to buy one, just to have one around the house. Yeah. Ms. O'Neill makes me nervous sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Need one for protection. And, uh, and so he said, Pastor, if I've not been his pastor, I promise you, for 40 years. He said, Pastor, he said, uh, don't buy one. He said, I have extras. I knew it was a gun, but I did not know he had extra AR-15. 
Mm. He says, I've got extras. He says, I will send you one. Mm. Wow. And sure enough, he did. And you, you really need to send it like through a licensed a gun dealer. Right. And so he did. He, he sent it down to the one just down, down below us there on Normandy. And when I got there and the, the guy went to open it up for me, he said, Pastor, he says, this is not a used gun. Mm. He says, this is brand new. <laughs> He says, it's never been untied. You know, the tie left. He says, this is brand new. The fellow was stretching. Okay, stretching. Um, let me just encourage you. I'm not against your yoga, <laughs> okay? I'm not against whatever you do to, you know, try to do your, your martial arts, you know, and you stretch your toes up here and all that kind of I'm not against all that, but stretch out for the Lord sometimes. Mm -hmm. okay? Go ahead and trust God and just give. A third exercise, I'm talking about spiritual. Exercise ourselves rather than God. A third exercise I would encourage you to do is on a daily basis, that is to choose God's Word. And I'm going to call that sit-ups. Okay? <laughs> and in, in Luke chapter 10, some of you remember the story about Mary and Martha. Amen. And uh, you remember the story of about how that uh, Martha, she did all the, all the dishwashing and vacuuming and all that. While Jesus was present, want to make the place look good for him. But Mary sat. What was she doing? Watching his feet. She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. That's where I get that from. That's Luke chapter 10. Verses 38 through 42. That's where I get the likeness of sit ups. Get up in the morning, sit up, and read the Word of God. Mm -hmm. For those of you that can do it, it might be a good time to get you a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. It'll help you. Choose God's Word. That's right. It was a choice she made. Martha said, Lord, I'm doing all the work. Get married to do something. And the Lord said, Martha, Martha, thou art cumbered about many things. She, he said to her, but one thing is needful. Then he added, Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken from her. And what the Bible says there in the context, she was sitting at Jesus' feet and hearing his word. Let's do some sit-ups. I would suggest that you do it early. Do you know what that's like? One of the things it's like in the Bible is an early morning bath. <coughs> Come on, some of you have a habit of taking an early morning bath, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Don't you? Does anybody have a habit of taking a bath? <laughs> <laughs> Ever so often? Once a, once a month? Once a week. Really okay. The Bible says that the Lord is cleansing his church with a washing of water by the word. In Ephesians chapter 5 and is sanctifying the church. He said in his prayer in John 17, 17 to the Father, sanctify them through thy truth. truth. Thy, thy word is truth. truth. In John 15, 3, Jesus said to the disciples, now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So let me encourage you, do some sit up. Do them early. Do them eagerly. Amen. Folks, one of the best habits I've ever had in my habit in my life have to do with the habit of reading the Word of God. Amen. I may not know all the Word of God, I may not study the Word of God like I should, but one of the best things that has happened in my Christian life has been just reading the Word of God Amen. every day Amen. throughout these years of knowing the Lord. Set you some goals. Out in the foyer, on the table, we've got some Bible reading uh, charts or guides that will help you if you want to have something to suggest what to read each day to go through the entire Bible. And you read through the Bible in a year. The average Christian can read through the Bible in a year in less than 15 minutes a day. My personal suggestion, and I'll preach on this between now and the end of the year to try to help you get provoked to do it next year. 
But my personal suggestion is, is start at the beginning, just read it right on through. If you get done early, start at the beginning, read it right on through again. And read it right on through again. A Christian that's been saved for more than a few years, that's been under the influence of a ministry like ours, where I've tried to emphasize this, and you've not read your Bible through even one time from front to back, as far as I'm concerned, you ought to be ashamed. If you've never been in a ministry where they encourage that, you're supposed to live by every word of God. How are you going to live by it if you've never read sections of the Bible? Yeah. Do you know the only way to, to make yourself read every word of the Bible is to go through the Bible reading every word yeah. from front to back? Any Christian that, that has average reading speed, you say, well, I think you ought to study the Bible. Study it! I'm encouraging you to read it in addition to anything you else do. Memorize it. It's okay with me if you want to memorize the entire book of Psalms. Memorize it. But don't neglect half of the Old Testament because you're not interested. I'll give you a few more. This one has to do with communion with God. What am I talking about? Anybody ever done these? Oh, yeah. One of the things that is referred to as deep knee bends, okay? Good, uh, that, that's a pretty good exercise to, to compare with prayer, shouldn't it be? Deep knee bends. And the Bible says in Ephesians 3, 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and then, then it gives one of his prayers. You say the largest muscle that a man has are in his legs, and the Bible talks about a man's, this power of man's, of man's legs. Um, men like to, if they go to the gym, men always like to major on the chest. I'm not sure what that is about. Hmm. You know, maybe it's our, our caveman mentality. I don't know what it is. But almost anybody goes into a gym at, at any length of time and somebody says, you know, you go regularly? And say, so, yeah. And always the question is, how much do you bench? Because <laughs> it has to do, has to do with, the, with the chest. But the greatest power that a man has, has I know it's connected with other muscles as well, but it has to do with the legs. Right? Squatting. And, and, you know, I'll never forget, so if you've heard me tell about it, I watched a man uh, power lift. He was a power lifter champion. And he power lifted, I think it was 601 pounds. Or he went down, broke parallel, came back, came back up. That was his third lift. And uh, for anybody that, you know, if you, if you weigh 601 pounds, that may not be that big of a lift. Yeah. <clears throat> he weighed 132 mm. pounds. Wow. Mm. Weighing 132 pounds, I watched him on his third lift squat something like 601 pounds. Uh -huh. That was some kind of a, a lift. Of course, you've heard the expression, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on his knees. Read your Bible, but don't forget to pray. I recommend this exercise several times a day. You might do one concentrated dose, and then you ought to consider doing it different times during the, during the day. And you can do it almost anywhere. I was, uh, I was waiting for Mrs. O'Neill this morning at one of her doctor's appointments, and of course I was dressed exactly like I am now, too lazy to change clothes. And so I was dressed like this in there. And sitting in there, I was, I was on the, one of these wooden chairs, and Mrs. O'Neill probably even noticed, she probably thought I was nervous. <coughs> but uh, I was lifting up on my, on my legs and feeling the, the, the legs exercise just to get a little bit of exercise. I'm telling you, you can pray at times and places you might not think you, you could be praying. Right. Some of you work jobs where you could pray at certain times while you're working. Mm -hmm. Because some of you work jobs that don't demand every bit of your mental capacity. You're just doing something, and you've got the opportunity to pray a little prayer. That would be a good time to pray. Right. I need your prayers, please. If you're, not, if you're doing nothing, pray for your preacher. Yeah. I need your prayers. I'll give you another one. 
I wish, I wish I had somebody here with great big eyebrows come up here and illustrate this for me. Because I'm going to call this one Eye Raises. Eye Raises. Ms. O'Neill, they made you do that today. They said, look over here. Look over here. Look over here. You know, as they looked into her eyes and, and uh, went way down deep. I don't, there's no telling what they saw beyond as they looked down deep into Ms. O'Neill's eyes. Do you know the Lord expects you to obey a command of his about your eyes? Amen. He told the disciples this right after he had spent a good bit of time and effort <clears throat> and compassion dealing with a fallen woman and pointing her to God. Amen. And they were out at Publix. That's where everybody's spiritual goes if they're not so funny, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> They were, after, they were out getting groceries. The Lord's winning this woman to God. And they came back and they said, Master E, we got a good deal. You wouldn't believe this. Bogo! Yeah. <laughs> and he says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. So what's going on? Did somebody bring him some sandwiches? Something we don't know about? The Lord said, he said, say not ye there yet four months, and then cometh harvest. He said, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. If you open up your eyes, there may be somebody where you work, somebody going up and down your street, somebody coming to your door even, Tomorrow, that you could point to the Lord. Amen. I'm talking about a compassion for souls for this seat. A compassion for souls, I raises. Every Christian should be a soul winner. Amen. Say, how many would you be satisfied with? You're having, now you're having a good group show up for soul winning visitation. Yes, we do. But I'd be thrilled if we had the same number for soul winning visitation that we have Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Amen. Amen. Consider the requirement. Lift up your eyes. Consider the result. You know, you know what the, the term they use for somebody whose whose eye doesn't seem to be working in his muscle development and, and it quits lifting up like it ought to? Or lazy eye. So it's sometimes it's referred to as lazy eye. You know what? If you will exercise this particular spiritual exercise, you won't have lazy eye. Some of you don't see lost souls because you don't look for them. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. You go in and out of that store without one time thinking of the spiritual need of one person in that store. Uh, Lift up your eyes will keep you from going to sleep. You never see anybody sleeping with their eyes looking up. Lift up your eyes. It'll help you to stay alert. Let me give you a couple more. One, I'm talking about concern for the body of Christ. Weightlifting. Some people have a variation of that where they don't lift as, as heavy weights as they do a multiplicity of movements, and they call it bodybuilding. Amen. I believe Christians ought to be into bodybuilding. And what I'm talking about is building up other believers. <coughs> I don't believe that you ought to, and by the way, let me get right here into physical real quick. I do not believe that you men ought to be muscular and manly and all that, even though I'm all for that. I'm, I'd much rather shake a hand of a man that feels like a man's handshake. When I say that, I'm not talking about you squeezing these ladies' hands and hurting them. You can be a gentleman. Everybody know what a gentleman is? That's what, somebody who controls their strength. But I'd much rather get a good grip from a man than, than this, you know, this limp womanly type of thing. But I don't believe God intends for you men to be strong just so that you can stand on the stage and say, look at this. Right. Yeah, right. I believe God wants you to be strong so you can work. 
I believe God wants you to be strong physically so you can get things done that need to be done. So that you can protect your family. Amen. 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 Now, if you get into doing this, I'm talking about weightlifting. What I'm talking about is you being willing to lift some weights in the church. Amen. I'm talking about you being willing to lift up. What a joy it was to see as one of our men, because of age, stepping out of a, a position in Sunday school and to see one of our newer men stepping right into that position. Amen. Amen. One's been lifting weights for a long time. One's coming in and saying, I'll take that from here on out. Right. I'll lift that for you. That's what I'm talking about, bodybuilding. I'm talking about you being willing to pick up something and, and do something. And yes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to involve some, some stress. It's going to involve some strain. Y'all remember, those, those of you who are acquainted at all with exercise, you may not have done any, but you've read about it. Okay? <laughs> they say, no pain, no gain. No gain. So if you're going to get stronger, you're going to have to make some effort. Amen. And if it don't hurt now, anybody know what I'm talking about to do something that you haven't done for a while? If it doesn't hurt now, it'll hurt, it'll hurt tomorrow. <laughs> it may hurt the next day. It may even hurt the day after that. Of course, my motto when I used to pump iron for years was no pain, no pain, no pain. <laughs> <laughs> What can you do? You can live, live, uh, live somebody a helping hand. Amen. It'll take, it'll involve pain. It'll involve pressure. May not be much, but you know what? It can be spiritual pressure to make yourself get on the phone and make a phone call Amen. and show some concern for somebody. Amen. We've got so many people in our church that would appreciate a phone call. Amen. Now, not everybody does, but there's some who need a phone call. Try calling some of them up. I'm not going to call their names out here in the message. Try calling them up. Lift group burdens. Figure out something you can do in the church and do it. And if you really want to grow stronger, do it again. Do it again. And do it again. And do it again. Then lastly, I'll say there's a, uh, what I'm going to call a competitive effort, where you're really trying hard to compete. And one of the places where the Bible talks about that, there's one particular exercise that is used there in that verse. In the context, there's another one that's referred to. But in that verse, I'm talking about running. We any runners in here? <laughs> Are you like me? The fellow said, yeah. I, uh, the other day, I just it's like a feeling came over me where I thought, this is the day where I start running. I'm going to run around the block. But the fellow found out that he said, when I get that feeling, I found out that if I'll go and sit down somewhere <laughs> and just be still for a little while, <laughs> the feeling will go away. <laughs> but as a Christian, do you know one of the things our Christian life compared to is a race? Running a race with patience, Hebrews said. No, you know not that they which run in the race run all, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says. But one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. Thinking about your way, a good runner will stay lean. If he's a real good runner, if he does it for a, a, lot of, a lot of times, a lot of miles, he'll get rid of the weight. And let me say, whatever you are doing for the Lord, you may find that there's some things that are weighing you down. They may not even be necessarily sinful, but because you're more interested in them, them than you are in running the race. Anybody remember the story of the tortoise and the hare? The one that could run the race and would have run the race and, and won it got distracted. Got distracted by that old oak tree. A good runner will stay lean. A good runner will strengthen his lungs. Let me say, if you're gonna run good for Jesus Christ, You've got to get filled with the Holy Spirit and with the Word of God. Amen. What kind of spiritual shape are you in? Shape up! Amen. Before you ship out. Would you stand together with me, please? Head bowed. Music is going to play. I hope we've given you some things to 
encourage you. Maybe some of you just going to leave here under conviction about needing physical exercise. That's not what the message is about. The message is about us not being spiritual constipation. If you're not careful, it's amazing how time flies. And if you're not careful, 